Tonight on Joy News Prime, we bring you two major stories. Finance Ministry refuses to provide details about 2.75 million savings on sole sourcing and restrictive tendering contracts. We have details as 21 anti-corruption organizations give the ministry another 10 days to provide information. Also, we have updates on contracts for sale investigations by Shraj as more revelations emerge. Communications Minister accuses telcos of robbing subscribers in the current implementation of the communication service tax following the 3% increase. ...at the expense of subscribers. They are now effectively robbing consumers by passing on the full tax while retaining the unused data and voice bundles. She's also threatening to crack the whip on telcos that fail to comply with the ministry's directive not to charge the CST upfront. They know better than to flout the laws of the jurisdictions in which they operate. And we will not countenance this imposition of untold, unwarranted suffering on the people of Ghana. Also on Joy News Prime, we'll look at the deplorable road situation in parts of Accra and the eastern region. This is the road. From uh, uh, there's a direct route through Kokwe to Jaskan. And look at it, we have to make no merry go round. I'm standing here since uh, 8 o'clock now. Not yet getting a car. This road is as bad in such a way that nobody wants to come here. Also in the bulletin, children in the East Mampusi municipality of the Northeast region are dropping out of school to hunt lizards and birds as teachers seek transfer due to the deplorable condition under which they teach. <laughs> And in business, public criticized the cabinet's decision to re register all SIM card holders, saying it's a waste of time. Really a waste of time because I don't know what change it will make because I've already registered my SIM and I don't know um, the impact it will make if I re register the SIM. Well, it's a waste of time because they have the previous data already. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Join us Prime comes to you live from our studios in Kotkom Limle on digital address GA0992539. Also on Go TV channel 144, DSTV channel 421. Please stay tuned. Many thanks for choosing us. Let's begin with the Minister for Communication, Eslo Wusu Ekufu, who says mobile telecommunication networks are effectively robbing consumers in the implementation of the communication service tax. According to her, the telcos are taking advantage of the 3% increase in the CST to pass on their entire tax to subscribers whilst retaining their unused data and voice bundles. Addressing journalists at the Meet the Press series in Accra, the Minister said, Sanctions will be imposed on telcos that fail to comply with the directive not to charge the CST upfront. It must be said that from 2008 to 30th September 2019, mobile network operators had been absorbing the 6% CST. And as far as the subscriber experience was concerned, this, but they suddenly decided to stop that practice when nothing had changed apart from the 3% increase in the rate of the existing tax. Get fund, NHIL and VAT levies are all deducted based on usage and not on an upfront deduction upon recharge. The ministry met network operators and the regulator on 7th and 8th October 2019, just a week after this tax came into effect on this unusual practice, which flew in the face of industry experience. And we were informed by the network operator that they took advantage of the 3% increase to pass on the entire tax to subscribers. This has effectively increased their profit margins at the expense of subscribers when there has been no other change in their operational environment. Whatever they may have lost in absorbing the 6% CST, 
They more than made up for it by refusing to roll over credit that had been paid for by consumers but remained unused on the expiration of the bundle period. They are now effectively robbing consumers by passing on the full tax while retaining the unused data and voice bundles on that. And if they persist, the requisite sanctions will be applied. If they want to continue doing business in this country, they will respect our laws. All of them are uh, international, uh, are multinationals. They operate in other jurisdictions. They know better than to flout the laws of the jurisdictions in which they operate as sanctions attach to it. We've had an extremely cordial relationship with them. I used to be in the industry. We work with them to resolve many challenges and are ready to assist them to navigate through this space as well. But we will not countenance this imposition of untold, unwarranted suffering on the people of Ghana. The minister gave a breakdown of how the policy directive applies to subscribers of the various telecommunications networks. There are examples of companies which roll over and use data bundles, even here in Ghana. Vodafone fixed broadband customers are able to keep their remaining data only if they top up before their bundle expires. This means at the expiry date of your bundle, if you don't top up, you lose all your remaining data. The new policy directive only means that all subscribers will enjoy what was limited to only Vodafone fixed broadband subscribers. And there will be no discrimination in the treatment of subscribers. MTN fixed broadband customers also required a specified minimum airtime on their fixed broadband number before the expiry date to keep their remaining data. Whereas prepaid customers lost all remaining data after the date of expiry, unless they had opted for rollover. The directive means all MTN subscribers will enjoy their unused voice and data upon recharge, regardless of the type of service they are on. Surfline customers who purchase a bundle before the expiry date enjoy automatic rollover, but after expiry date, they lose the remaining data bundle. This practice must stop with a directive and all customers must enjoy the unused voice and data bundles they have already paid for, regardless of time of recharge. Well, the minority in Parliament has described as illegal this directive by the Communication Ministry. Kessel Atufos and his minority spokesperson on finance. They don't understand taxation. And that's why they are making that kind of conclusions. They are not tax experts. They have no knowledge on taxation. So they should not dabble in things that they do not understand. In fact, it is an illegal letter, and I will encourage the telcos to ignore that letter because it cannot be accepted. But in a response, Madame Ekufu says anyone who is of the view the directive is illegal can challenge it in court. I don't know about the directive being illegal. The Electronic Communications Act mandates or gives the minister the authority to make, give policy <coughs> directives to the regulator in the management of this industry. It doesn't prescribe the manner in which those policy directives should be given or limit the scope of the policy directives. And so those who are saying that it is illegal, I would urge them if they like, to challenge it in the proper form, and we will engage with them accordingly. The law passed by Parliament is clear that the communication service tax is a usage tax. It is imposed, levied on charges payable by a user of an electricity. It's been about 37 working days since an official complaint was filed to the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice Raj and the Office of the Special Prosecutor to investigate conflict of interest and corruption allegations leveled against the suspended Chief Executive of the Public Procurement Authority, PPA. ABAJ's company, TDL, was found to have sold contracts in investigative documentary put together by freelance investigator Manasseh Azoria when it titled Contracts for 
appeal, after which President Ekufuado on 22nd August 2019 filed a complaint to the Office of the Special Prosecutor and Charge to investigate. We have an update on the charge investigations. MFA Powell has been working her sources at the charge and joins me in studio. Hi, MFA. Hi, Aisha. What else do we know? Okay, so first of all, I would say that um, significant progress has been made in terms of this investigation. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's been 37 days since that complaint was filed. One would have thought that would have had some kind of, uh, you know, verdict on this matter already so we can get it over and done with. But what we know so far is that a number of ministries, departments and agencies have been invited to bring some form of documentation in terms of anyone mm. that has dealt with their suspended PPA boss, Ejenim Boati Eje, at any point in time to provide all documentations to them. What our sources tell us that indeed they got about sacks of documents okay. and literally they got sacks of documents um, on all the contracts that Mr. Janim Wating AJ has executed or approved or dealt with. And what we know also is that apart from a number of ministries though, some of them are yet to provide the documents that the PA, the Shraj is asking for. Mm. So, you know, Shraj has a quasi high court uh, jurisdiction. Yes. So they have had to invoke that uh, to subpoena most of them to be able to bring those documents and make it available to them to help the investigation. Okay. Uh, apart from the ministries, departments and agencies, who else have been invited? Okay, so of course, uh, the person at the center of it all is Manasseh Azuria Winnie. He put together that documentation, the freelance investigative journalist. Yeah. He has been the, one of the first people to be invited. He's provided all the videos, the documents, and uh, the full interview that he had with Mr. Janim TJ in that documentary that has been made available uh, to Shraj. We also know that the board chairman of the PPA, Professor Douglas Boating, mm -hmm. he was also invited. But guess what, Aisha? When he was invited, the whole board went along with him to Shraj and they've all been interrogated as well long hours they all went through the process and they've all been interrogated about what they know because of course the board approved all contracts mm -hmm. that Mr. Janim Boatiej is alleged to have passed through his company TDL okay. uh, for the sale we also know that the acting CEO of PPA Mr. Frank Mante mm -hmm. he was the deputy to Mr. Janim Boatiej yeah. he has also been invited and he's also giving his testimony to Shraj okay but of course if you look at the letters that were sent to Shraj mm -hmm. and um, the Special Prosecutor's Office, the President asked them to um, interrogate or uh, probe the conflict of interest bit, but it appears they've gone beyond that. Yes, of course. Shraj has expanded that. Uh, it's gone beyond conflict of interest accurately, like you say. They are now looking at the corruption aspect of it, even though the Office of the Special Prosecutor is looking at the corruption aspect. You know, Shraj has a mandate of looking at corruption issues as well. Mm. So they've said that, considering the information that they've gathered from the people that they've spoken to, it's become necessary mm. to look at corruption as well. So that's what they're also looking at, apart from the conflict of interest allegations. But earlier on, you spoke with counsel for the PPA boss, Yaopon, on Top Story. Are they happy with the investigation so far? So they are, con they are concerned. Um, before we spoke to him on air, is about the fact that they have not been uh, told about what is going on because earlier they actually um, sent a message, uh, a letter to Shraj asking that they get a public hearing of everything that has gone on so far. Mm -hmm. But that's what has not been done so far. We know we got a letter uh, from Shraj responding to them, uh, the lawyers, that this is the situation. They will have to satisfy all the aspects of these investigations. And when it becomes necessary, they would give them a public hearing. But that assistance now has not been done. Okay. And the man in the center of affairs for now, Mr. Janim Boatiji, has not been invited so far. Mm -hmm. We inquired why, and we're told that it's because after they get everything they need, then Mr. Janim Boatiji, who is a star witness, will then be invited to hear his testimony as well. To hear his testimony as well. Now, we are also told at some point the Public Procurement Authority had saved the country up to 2.75 million Ghana cities from single source and restrictive tendering contracts. Now, the Finance Ministry was then petitioned by a coalition of anti corruption organizations with up to 21 members. They gave the Finance Ministry up to 14 days to provide details of each of the contracts with the following verification the name of the contract and the awarding entity, that's the MMDA, the initial cost and revised cost at which the contract was awarded awarded the company or companies to which the contract was um, awarded and uh, when the contract was awarded 
and this was done on the 17th of September 2019. Now, they are yet to receive a response from the finance ministry. And Joy News is learning that a reminder has been sent to the ministry again, and that is dated on the 11th of October. Um, MFA, you've been engaging the anti-corruption coalition. What have they been telling you? So they are surprised, as most of us are, about why they have not received any information so far from the finance ministry. Mm -hmm. And like you said, they did that on the 17th of September. They give the, the ministry 14 days to give them a response. Because if you say we've saved so much, uh, 2.7 million Ghana cities, why is it so difficult to give us the details on what these contracts uh, entails? So they've given them another 10 days. We have a copy of the reminder uh, asking the finance ministry to now give them another response within the next 10 days. So that is something we are following up on and as and when we get a response to the fine from the finance ministry definitely we'll put it out for our listeners thank you very and much mfa a power and we'll be following this to the last bit and update our viewers on the uh, conclusions of the investigations now residents of Mahia and surrounding communities near ablikuma were left stranded today following what commercial drivers call a silent protest the action is a protest that uh, to protest the deplorable nature of food that links Area, the area to the main Ablikuma stretch. The, cl uh, the close to seven kilometer stretch has developed deep potholes, gullies, and ponds. And despite numerous demonstrations, nothing has been done to fix the road. Latifa Dries has been speaking to residents. Every day we keep hearing harrowing stories about how pregnant or expectant mothers living in Mahian, Joma, and adjoining communities suffer miscarriages because of the bad nature of the road. Now today, the road has gone so bad, drivers who commute this road have decided to withdraw their services simply because the road is taking a toll on their businesses. That is affecting the working class who live and do businesses here in Mahia and some adjoining communities. In the background, you would find a number of residents who are now stranded because they cannot get vehicle to transport them to the central business district to execute their various businesses. Yeah. I'm standing here since uh, 8 o'clock now. Since and 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock in the morning. Wow. And they're not yet getting a car. This over two hours? Yes, please. And we don't know why. This road is as bad in such a way that nobody wants to come here. Mm. And it seems the government doesn't care. And some of us, we were born around this area. I'm now 50 years of age. So since 50 years, they are not really ready to, to, to do this road. Mm. And this is the same situation that we face. And you love the road? No. Mm. It's very bad. Some, yeah, like we have in a car, it, it just damaged the car. So like, we don't normally use it. You, mean a pri you had a private yeah. car? Yeah. And um, what happened to it? it at the shops and everything. I wouldn't want to push you much. But what do you want to see done about the state oh, of the road? For me, if even I was saying to a friend that was, I bought a car with him three days ago, that if I have money, I will mm. put a sandboard, a big giant sandboard here. Mm. There are no road, no votes. Mm. If, I'm, I'm, uh, if the people really will support me, if they will not fix the road, we will not vote for them. Mm. Imagine having to drive through a road with a depth of two feet. That's not all. You also have to pay up to 10 Ghana cities to get your vehicle out of what could also best be described as a pond when your luck runs out and you get stuck. That is the sad reality for many road users living in Accra. Nancy M. Fajiradusi visited the North Industrial Area, Bubiashi, and Dan Suman in our reports. Today, this road may seem to you as just a normal one, but today the rains have revealed serious potholes, something that can be described as a mini pond. That is what I see here at the industrial area. The drivers tell me that it has affected their cars and the political government to step in. When they are able to do this road, it helps ease the traffic on the graphic road because most of the cars apply this route to the other uh, to the industrial area and if they are able to do it it will help us all so we are pleading to the authorities to help us because it's very bad road na disturbing power eh your shocks in a car as you know to near my chair and i say there is rabbi so i'm going to on my road in my took us about close to five minutes to actually drive 
on this very terrible road. What you see are mini dugouts um, that have been created here at Bubuashi. Just about five meters separating each dugout from each other. Now, residents in this area say they have complained several times to the MP for this area, but nothing has been done. Like if the rain fall, the portals is full of water and it splashes to my shop. So if the rain fall like this, I have to take a broom and sweep all the water out from the, the portals. The MP here is not helping us at all. We are facing so, cha so many challenges in our area. It's full of portals, so our customers even don't come to buy from us because of the portals. So we are begging the government, the MP, and whoever who is there to help us to solve these things out, but because we are finding it difficult here. If you see the road, no, we are working here. I get me. I use my truck to carry my things around. The road has spoiled. The road is not good at all. Last two weeks, the honorable came here and said that it's come to do the road. But along the road, they just run and leave the road like that. So we are, we are in fact, I'm, I'm really tired of this road. So what you see is a vehicle um, with its occupants getting down because the car cannot move here um, at the Ansonic bus stop. There is a gully, which could also best be described as a pond. It can go as deep as two feet. And so there are gentlemen stationed here helping these vehicles to come out of the pond. And after that, they take some money they charge money from the drivers for helping them. You had to come out of the vehicle at a point. Yeah, for them to push the car. Like, I'm even scared, you know? I'm, I can't believe this. I've never seen something like this before. I mean, I know usually the roads are bad, but this is unbelievable. It's like a whole gutter out there, like a manhole or a borehole. Very, very difficult. Not here alone, from Odoko up to here, it's very, very bad. They have, they have to do something about it. We are, we are soft. So anytime it rains here, we find it difficult to pass this lane. It's very, very difficult. So you have to do something about it. Yeah, 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 da. When I see the AMA lances, the way I got here, where they have one year, one year, poly, 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 one year. Ghana, yeah, 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 da. Eh, but yeah, where you check two CD, answer the echo. I don't, I don't have a bed. Eh, I don't have a bed. I don't have now, for many years, the Eastern Corridor Road has been a major political campaigning issue. Both President Ekufuado and his predecessor, John Mahama, have made promises to fix them. Well, it's been raining lately. The situation on the road is worsening. And vehicles have run through gullies and trenches, with some of them getting stuck in the mud. Residents and commuters are now worried about the state of affairs. Our two region correspondent, Peter Baron, has more in the following report. <laughs> Low level of development in the then Volta region with specific regard to roads was a major election campaign message in the 2016 general elections used by the ruling NPP to cut love ties between the NDC, then ruling government, and the residents of the region. However, the famous or rather infamous Eastern Corridor roads and others are yet to see any improvement over the three and a half or so years under the NPP led government. In fact, Roads in the region have deteriorated. These people here attempt to fix this section of the road and take the advantage to make some money. I'm going to Accra, from KJB to Accra. Oh, it's because of the condition of the road. That's why we bypass, we are passing through this. Normally, our road is between KJB, Jessica, Hohoi, then you, you bypass. Things almost turn sour, as this driver and his mate claimed they had sorted them out the previous day. 
They explained why they have decided to fix the road here. One can make a tall list of deplorable roads in the Oti region. Talk about Nkwanta Pasa Road, KJB Jasikain Road, the infamous undulating Jasikain Hohwe Road, Jasikain Rawa Road, Jasikain Abutwasi Road, Dambae Pando Road, and many others. Are we also in Ghana? Look at our road. Look at my dressing. The Minister of Roads and Highways, Amwakwata, Kwata, says even though government is committed to completing all ongoing road projects in time, it will not tolerate contractors who do shoddy work. He said a 2.2 billion Ghana cities has been secured to pay outstanding debt owed contractors and warned government will not hesitate to abrogate contracts of inefficient contractors. He gave the warning when the president, Ekufuato, and other government officials inspected a number of road projects in the eastern region. And so to come in this bulletin, children in the East Mampushi municipality of the Northeast region are dropping out of school to hunt lizards and birds as teachers seek transfer due to the deplorable condition under which they teach. <laughs> And in business, public criticized Cabinet's decision to re-register all SIM card holders, saying it's a waste of time. Actually a waste of time because I don't know what change it will make because I've already registered my SIM and I don't know um, the impact it will make if I re-register the SIM. Well, it's a waste of time because they have the previous data already. There is more when we return from the break. Check out uh, health matters, and uh, a lot of them uh, we're talking about breast cancer awareness tips um, to, uh, how to reduce the risk. Breastfeeding your baby for as long as possible helps to reduce the risk of breast cancer. Women who breastfeed their babies for at least a period of two years in total have a reduced risk of developing breast cancer later. And also being physically active helps to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. Women who are physically active for at least 30 minutes a day have a lower risk of breast cancer. Physical activities, even when uh, begun later in life, reduces overall breast cancer risk by about 10 to 30%. And Eating healthy is also part of reducing the risk. Eating a healthy meal reduces the risk of breast cancer development. A healthy diet must include lots of vegetables. We're also told to eat lots of fruits and lower the intake of freezy drinks, refined carbohydrates and fatty foods. It's a breast cancer month. Don't forget to go for screening. Now to the rest of our stories. And children in the East Mampusi municipality of the Northeast region are dropping out of school to hunt lizards and birds. Johnny says Ilya Sotanko was in the area and reports children are refusing to go to school because of the deplorable conditions under which they learn. That's more in the following report. In many schools in the Mamprusi area, study under deplorable conditions. From rough to unventilated classrooms to dilapidated structures, children either lay on their stomach or sit on hard stones to learn. Seven-year-old boy, Napari Acheri, is shirtless, working in a backyard garden. When John News inquired, Napari said his mother, who was away, asked him to look after his two little sisters. Marinka, 
This practice has become a trend due to challenges in the education sector. In the Zarantinga MA primary school near the capital, Nalerugu, lack of classrooms and desks are causing parents to withdraw their children from school. The school, with a population of around 400, is made up of three classroom structure, where children in primary five and six are made to share one. Headmistress of the school, Larison Nimaliba, tells Joy News the situation has affected enrollment and academic performance of the children. According to her, some teachers have refused posting to the school, whilst majority of existing staff are demanding transfer. The heat, the heat season is not always easy. We find it very difficult. You sit with the children under sun. You see that the place is not all that shady. So we sit under the sun. The moment is level going to drop. You see them, they will start sweating. And it's not always easy with us. Infrastructure, some of the teachers are trying to take transfer outside the school. Because they have seen no reason why we are the same people. Others we enjoy facilities, even with pass in their classrooms. And we are here sitting under trees. So that means some of us they are running the only teacher handling kindergarten, Mumuni Hawabu, said she chose not to take a transfer because she wants to help the children. It's not easy. That's why when they are transferring teachers to this place, they used to refuse. But we, those who, who are feeling pity about the children, we don't want to go and leave the children. But if they transfer a teacher to this school, they refuse to come. And some, they will come and they will take transfer and ram. Yes, they don't motivate us, but we as a human being, we feel very pity for the community and the children. That's the reason. But motivated as no one motivated. Sometimes when you are doing as them to help you, like any child, uh, school tables and what they want to do, even no one is The community members are calling on government and the education ministry to intervene. Mm. <laughs> Education authorities, office of the municipal chief executive, were both not available for comment. Away from that large part of the capital, Accra have for years been seen of gunfights as gun tooting land guards take over lands they do not own or protect the land of those willing to pay for their services. At Nsakina near Amasaman, a sprawling suburb of the capital, land guards have taken their activities a notch higher. They are filing river banks and uh, the filling river banks and selling them to developers scrambling for space in a crowd poorly planned and haphazardly built city. In the following report, Joy News' Latif Idris explores the dangers and risks associated with the unlawful, unregulated land reclamation of the river and the immediate and long-term impact it could have on residents and the country as a whole. In Sakina is a traditional Ga community with a population of about 1,000 people. The fast developing suburb is caught up in the urban sprawl. River Insaki, on which I am literally standing, is one of the tributaries of the Wager Dam and the Densu River. But at the blind side of the authorities, some faceless individuals are pushing the boundary of the river by reclaiming it with laterite and garbage, risking lives and setting the stage for a future disaster. Land garden is a major problem here, and lives and property have been lost as a result. Queen Mother of the area, Nasakwa I, has been working with the assembly to end the dangerous development of reclaiming and selling parts of the Nsaki River. But so far, nothing has changed. Developers are busily filling parts of the Nsaki River with materials to put up a fuel station. The station adds to a chain of homes that have already been built on this otherwise flowing water body, which is now a shadow in its former self. Mm. 
We are sending a message to government to come in and stamp its authority to stop the reclamation and sale of the land. A scientist at CSIR, Mr. Amechichi, says the practice has the potential of impacting the rate of flow of river with devastating effect. When there's flash flooding, that is sudden rain, with sudden intense rainfall, it leads to severe flooding that may wash away properties, destroy property, redistribute contaminated water into people's homes, contaminate wells that serve as uh, drinking water for many people in poor areas in the urban areas. It also has the potential of fueling climate change, a phenomenon that no country under the sun, according to the International Panel on Climate Change, has the capacity to fully deal with. Abdul Lamoxit is secretary of the International Panel on Climate Change. All the activities. It also showed that no region, no small place in the world is not affected by a climate change. Developed or develop, developing countries are concerned. And not only this, and this is also at the heart of what is now discussed, discussed. all the countries, even developed, don't have the capacity to adapt and to manage those extreme events. Special Envoy for Science in Global Policy at the International Science Council, Dr. Flavia Schlegel, is concerned about the impact of the practice on the ecosystem. The question with reclaiming the river is, are you getting together as communities along these rivers because there is upstream and there is downstream? So are the people from upstream talking to the people from downstream? Are you aware that you're not polluting the rivers through what you put in the soil when you grow your plants? Are you overfishing your river? Um, are you taking away water in season where you actually should keep it in the river? So I guess it is, there is a lot of knowledge about how to manage the natural resources you have. The United Nations forecast of the impact of climate change shows that nations would in the coming years invest trillions of United States dollars in infrastructure to mitigate climate change. Secretary General of the United Nations Antonio Gutierrez has therefore encouraged nations to make the building of resilient infrastructure central to their investments. From the South Pacific to Mozambique to the Caribbean and beyond, I've seen the devastating and life-changing impact of the climate emergency on vulnerable communities. Disasters inflict horrendous suffering and can wipe out decades of development gains in an instant. In the coming decade, the world will invest trillions of dollars in new housing, schools, hospitals and infrastructure. Climate resilience and disaster risk reduction must be central to this investment. There is a strong economic case for such steps. Making infrastructure more climate resilient can have a benefit cost ratio of about six to one. For every dollar invested, six dollars can be saved. The faceless individuals may be undertaking the nefarious activity of reclaiming a primary source of potable water for thousands, if not millions of people in the national capital at the blind side of the law today but if and when disaster strikes tomorrow, it will be glaring and the states will rush here with aid. A stage in time we say saves nine. Latifi Dries, Joy News from the swampy Insake River. And back here in the studio and in Accra, my name is Aisha Prime. You're still watching Joy News Prime. We'll be back with more. And that's how we wrap up the news tonight. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. For more news, log on to myjohnline.com for updates of the developing stories. Enjoy the rest of our programs.